Um, obviously, we're coming to you in English, which is the language of the colonizer. But um, rather than, but before we proceed in English, um, let's hear a few words in Arabic from Imtithal. Yeah. Hi everyone. Um, so, مساء الخير ومرحبا بكم في هذا الحدث عن اللغة الإنجليزية والعربية المحكية في فلسطين. يرجى ملاحظة أنه سيجيل الحدث ويمكنكم إرسال أسئلتكم باللغة الإرلندية أو العربية أو الإنجليزية في الجزء المخصص في الأسئلة والأجوبة في الأسفل. So, اسمي انتثال عودي وأنا co-founder director في London Learning Cooperative وهي تجربة يمكن الوصول إليها جذريا في علم التربية النقدي ومعاجلة الإنفاسية والدولية على الرغم من أن يقاد الحدث باللغة الإنجليزية أثرت اللغة العربية الفلسطينية الإيرلندية كلغات بشكل كبير بمواجهات الأنظمة الاستعمارية. تستخدم هذه الأنظمة القانون كوحدة من آليات عديدة للحفاظ وتوسيع هيمنتها على السكان الذين تستعمرهم. وهذا لا ينطبق فقط على فرد مجموعات لغوية معينة وتهميش الآخرين وتخصيصهم مثل العربية، بل ينطبق أيضا على الطرق التي تفرض بها الأنظمة الاستعمارية وأنظمتها الأمنية البديلة في كل منطقة خطابا للوصالة للوصالة والإذاء. وفي كل من إيرلندا وفلسطين تحاول قوات الاحتلال تجنب التغيرات الجذرية داخل الأراضي المحتلة ومن ناحية أخرى فإن اللغة المقيدة نسبيا بموجب القانون الدولي والإجراءات المؤقتة غير الهيكلية تهيمن على المشهد لتعزيز وسائل الإنتاج الاستعمارية في حين حاول البعض تقليل من أهمية اللغة يصبح من المهم بشكل صريح وفحص وتحليل الطرق التي تم بها استخدام اللغة لمزيد من الاستعمار إلى جانب الطرق التي يمكننا بها تخريب فائدة اللغة والمصطلحات لزيادة المقاومة ضد الاستعمار في الوضع الدولي أنا أنا شخصيا كلاجئة فلسطينية انتقدت اللغة التي تغرسها مجموعة متنوعة من المؤسسات والتي يبدو أنها تعزز الوضع الراهن لغويا على الأقل يتم تصوير اللاجئين على أنهم ضحايا عاجزين بحاجة إلى شخص ما لرعايتهم أو التعاطف معهم ولكن استعلاء نرفض هذا التعاطف بل ندعم العمل الراديكالي المباشر أي خطاب مناهض للإمبريالية تؤكد حقنا تقييم اللغة المستخدمة لا يتعلق فقط بالطرق التي نواجه بها كشعبين فلسطيني وإيرلندي الخطاب الذي يستخدمه الإمبرياليين ولكن أيضا تلك المستخدمة من قبل الشعوب المستعمرة نفسها حيث يتم إعلامهم وتأثرهم مباشرة بالهيمنة الثقافية للمستعمرين في أول أحداث عديدة تربط إيرلندا وفلسطين يسعد أن أنكم اخترتم الانضمام إلينا في هذا الاستكشاف من اللغة ومفهوم إنهاء الاستعمار في إيرلندا وفلسطين مع الأخذ في الاعتبار حقيقة أن الحدث باللغة الاستعمارية والإنجليزية الإنجليزية هي المسؤولة عن قمع الإيرلنديين فإننا نأمل في تقديم الأحداث المستقبلية بالعربية والإيرلندية كليهما نحن كليهما نحن ملتزمون بزيادة وجود اللغة الإيرلندية في المدارس والجامعات الفلسطينية وغيرها في الشتات الأوسع نجت اللغة الإيرلندية من هجمة الإمبريالية البريطانية ومن ذلك نرى نفس روح الصمود التي تدعم الشعب الفلسطيني اليوم تقوم لندن ليرنينج كوبرتيف بتعليم العربية الفلسطينية والإيرلندية إذا كان هذا يهمكم موقع يرجى زيارة موقعنا على الإنترنت للتسجيل فإن دورة اللغة الإيرلندية تبدأ مساء غد وسيكون من الرائع أن يتعلم الكثير من الفلسطينيين هذه اللغة الجميلة القديمة وهي موقع الكثير من الشعر والمقاومة والمناهضة للإستعمار لن يكون هذا سوى الحدث الأول من بين العديد من الأحداث التعاونية في لندن لاستكشاف إقامة العلاقات شعب بين شعب إيرلندا وفلسطين شكرا لكم انه عم تحضرونا and then back to you Frank Thank you so much Intertal um, So good evening everyone and welcome to this event about uh, the Irish language and the Arabic that's spoken in Palestine uh, Please note that this event is being recorded and it will be um, circulated afterwards um, there's going to be a question and answer session at the end, which you can access using the Q&A function on your Zoom app. Uh, so my name's Frank McGuinness. I'm a co-founding director with uh, Imtithal and uh, my friend Ben, who is behind the scenes tonight um, of the London Learning Cooperative. Um, and that is a radically accessible experiment in uh, critical pedagogy, anti-imperialism and internationalism. Uh, so we have tutors around the world in places like Gaza, uh, places like Pakistan, uh, like the six counties in uh, the north of Ireland, uh, places like Venezuela, as well as in London and France. 
and we continue to expand, uh, we're trying to create a truly global network of people um, uh, forging anti-imperialist praxis and critical pedagogy. Uh, now, as languages, both Irish and uh, Palestinian Arabic have been profoundly affected by their respective encounters with colonial regimes. Um, and those regimes also use law as one of the many mechanisms by which to maintain and extend their domination of the populations that they colonize. And that's why we're here tonight to talk about law and language in both Ireland and Palestine. Um, and uh, the, the purpose behind tonight's event really more than anything is to try and forge meaningful um, organic ties between the people and the cultures of those two places. Um, now, um, this applies, this kind of colonial logic applies not only to the direct imposition of a particular language um, and uh, the marginalization and appropriation of other languages, um, but it's also about um, the ways in which colonial, colonial regimes and their security regimes um, in each respective region impose a discourse of mediation and victimization. So on both Ireland and Palestine, um, occupying forces attempt to avoid radical changes within the occupied territories. And um, on the other hand, uh, language is relatively constrained by international law and um, non-structural temporary procedures which dominate the scene to reinforce the colonial means of production. Now, some have attempted to downplay the importance of language, um, and so it becomes explicitly important for us to uh, examine and al analyze ways in which language has been used to further the project of colonization, um, but also to consider ways in which language acts as a site of subversion and the, the use and the utility of language and terminology and how that can be used to further anti-colonial resistance in an internationalist uh, vein. Um, now, um, speaking personally, I come, from, uh, I come from South Armagh. I was born in Dublin, but I grew up in, in South Armagh. And um, for reasons that we don't need to necessarily get into, I went to a school that didn't teach the Irish language. And so the fact of the matter is that I was raised in a language that was different to that in which the place I come from was written. Uh, now, I have recently, through London Learning Cooperative, started to relearn my own language. I've, I'm, I'm really pleased to be learning uh, the Irish language through um, LLC. And if any of you, like me, want to reconnect with the Irish language, um, then I'd encourage you to look at the various um, events and courses that we're trying to offer to allow people to connect with the Irish language and other languages, but in a political and a historical context. Um, and one of the things that we're particularly keen on is the idea that um, is that lots of Palestinians, people in Palestine, people in the diaspora should start to learn the Irish language and vice versa, that people in Ireland should start to learn uh, the Arabic as it's spoken in Palestine so that we can forge, as to say, these, like, these profound cultural and linguistic ties between our two uh, colonized peoples with a view to, to furthering um, the, uh, the aim of decolonization. Um, so this is the first of many events, we hope, uh, linking Ireland and Palestine um, we're delighted that you've chosen to join us in this exploration of law, language, and decolonization in Ireland and Palestine. Um, so as I've said, obviously, that the, the, the event is taking place in the colonial language of English, but it does at least uh, bring us together that language. So we're all able to understand each other to the extent that we understand English. Um, and so even though that, that, that language sort of um, played its role in oppressing the Irish, we uh, hope to explore future events in, um, in Arabic and in Irish and possibly even in both languages. So sort of watch this space. Um, we're committed to increasing the presence of the Irish language, as I say, in Palestinian schools and universities and, uh, and others within the broader Palestinian diaspora. Um, and so if that's something that, uh, that interests you, then do please reach out to us and talk to us about what we're trying to do. We really want to engage you. We wanna hear what you have to say, however critical it might be. Um, and um, I suppose one thing that we, we're trying to emphasize as well, we're trying to explore this Palestinian concept of Samud this idea of steadfastness that um, sustains the Palestinian people in their struggle against Israeli imperialism and apartheid, um, and looking at the way in which the Irish um, have, you know, the Irish language survived its violent contact with uh, British colonialism. And that tends to show that the Irish have their own kind of uh, local concept of Samud, or like our own concept of steadfastness. So that's one of the things we'll explore together uh, tonight. Uh, as I say, LLC teaches both Irish and Palestinian Arabic, as well as a growing number of uh, different languages and skills. We're moving into law, we're moving into various other uh, useful skills. Um, so do please check out our website and consider signing up to um, one of our courses. Um, our latest course is an Irish language course that's starting tomorrow evening. It would be wonderful to have as many Palestinians as possible learning this uh, beautiful language, um, which has been the site of so much uh, anti-colonial poetry and resistance. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce the speakers as they arise. So we'll turn first to um, 
Mira Hamad. She's the first of our pa panelists. She's a pupil barrister at Garden Court North Chambers in Manchester in Britain. Uh, prior to commencing pupillage, Mira worked on the Grenfell Inquiry as a solicitor with Bindman's, representing bereaved survivors and residents. And under the auspices of the award-winning Palestinian NGO Al Haq, she is the co-author with myself of a forthcoming series of reports on the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs and its defamatory attacks against Palestinian NGOs. Over to you, Mira. Thanks, Frank. Um, so I'm going to be talking about three phenomena in relation to the intersection of law and language in the Palestinian context. And they're all part of the overarching trend of the dispossession and erasure of the Palestinian people. So firstly, we have almost mirroring the physical dispossession of Palestinians of their land, this linguistic dispossession of Palestinians of international legal terminology. So certain legal words and therefore concepts that Palestinians aren't permitted to use. Secondly, we have the weaponization of legal terminology to silence Palestinian dissent. And thirdly, Israel's constraint of and move towards the erasure of the Arabic language. So to start off um, with linguistic dispossession, what do we mean when we talk about dispossession of legal terminology? In essence, it's a targeted attempt by the Israeli regime, as well as some international actors, to deprive Palestinians of language with which to address their wrongs. And there are many examples of this, sorts of words that Palestinians aren't allowed to use, like apartheid, sanction, war crime, and self-defense. I'm going to focus specifically on apartheid. Now, apartheid is an internationally defined crime. It's a legal term. Um, and it's defined in Article 7 of the Rome Statute of the ICC. Um, and it talks about certain acts of persecution that are committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression um, and domination by one racial group over another racial group, essentially. And I'm not going to go into the substantive issue of why many Palestinians, inc including myself, believe that Israel is committing apartheid. What I'm interested in when we talk about language is the constraint or the pushback against Palestinians and their supporters for using the term at all. So in other words, the creation of a taboo, uh, the promotion of an idea that the facts on the ground, not that the facts on the ground don't amount to apartheid, so not engaging in the argument around apartheid, but the idea that Palestinians even using the word is morally wrong and unacceptable. There are many examples of the way that Israel uh, does this. So we can look at Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs and the project that myself and Frank are working on and its repeated attempts to persuade funders like the EU to cut off funding for organizations who use the word apartheid in relation to Israel. Um, and what's, and that is achieved through tactics like issuing reports which purportedly expose the EU for funding these NGOs. And you have a report like the Money Trail, which was released in May 2018, which explicitly seeks to defund NGOs based on their participation in campaigns around Israeli apartheid. So for example, uh, that report targets War on Want and the Palestinian Land Research Center Association, and it sets these organizations side by side with organizations who allegedly, according to the uh, Israeli government, support terrorism. So in other words, they're trying to create this moral equivalence between the use of legal language and violence. And that taboo is also, of course, pushed by pro-Israeli groups around the world. And one notable example of that was the cancellation of a speech at a museum in Vienna in uh, April 2019 by Ronnie Kasserlis, who is a South African Jew who was prominent in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. Um, and he attended to speak, intended to speak about the parallels between uh, South African apartheid and apartheid in Palestine. But even having that conversation was deemed to be taboo. 
So moving on to the second strand and the weaponization of language, uh, I'm going to focus specifically on Israel's successful painting of Palestinians as terrorists. Uh, of course, that's nothing new. Edward Said in 1998 uh, said, to most Palestinians, to most people, Palestinians are visible principally as fighters, terrorists, and lawless pariahs. Um, and of course, nothing has changed. But what is terrorism as a legal concept? Now, unlike apartheid, there is no internationally agreed definition. Um, and the disagreement as to the definition actually revolves around this issue of what is legitimate resistance. Um, so despite the fact that there's no international, uh, internationally agreed uh, definition of terrorism, Israel, of course, does have a definition of terrorism. Importantly, there's no requirement in the Israeli definition uh, for there to be violence involved directed at any person. So Israel defines terrorism uh, as being carried out for certain motives, including political, religious, uh, nationalistic, um, for the intention of either provoking fear or of compelling a government or um, other kinds of organizations to do or abstain from doing any act. But very importantly, an act of terrorism in Israeli law can constitute simply serious harm to infrastructure, systems, or essential services, or their severe disruption, or serious harm to the state's economy or the environment. So we can imagine how that definition can catch legitimate political action. So for example, here in the UK, we've had the Extinction Rebellion. Now, the Extinction Rebellion would be caught under that definition of terrorism because the central purpose of it is to cause severe disruption for a political purpose to compel the government to take action on climate change. But what we see in terms of the weaponization of the word terrorist is the Israeli government going even further than that definition. So we have the Ministry of Strategic Affairs making wide sweeping allegations that various people or NGOs are connected to terrorism um, and not even bothering to uh, tell us how that fits into their very wide definition of terrorism. And obviously a very recent example of this has been the way that Israel painted protesters in the return march as terrorists. There was no effort put into explaining how they fell within that definition even that very wide definition. And of course, the UN Independent uh, Commission of Inquiry uh, rejected Israel's argument that there was, that these people who were killed were terrorists. But we can see that Israel uses the word, which is a legal word outside of its legal context. And thirdly, and I'm conscious of the time, Frank, um, thirdly, I'd just like to touch on the erasure of the Arabic language as part of the erasure of Palestinian people. And many of you will have heard of the passing of the nation state law. And among other things, that removed Arabic as an official language alongside Hebrew. So Arabic became a language with a special status, um, but it's important to consider that that was a part of a piece of legislation which wasn't produced uh, to administratively um, rule on language, it was part of a piece of legislation which proclaimed loudly that Israel was the historic homeland of the Jewish people, and they, and only they, had an exclusive right to national self-determination in it. And so this entire piece of legislation was aimed and focused at the erasure of Palestinian people, an Arabic language was part of the tools that Israel used in that. And finally, I think it's important when we talk about the law and language to remember, of course, that the language of the law in Israel is Hebrew. Legislation is drafted in Hebrew. Judicial proceedings and decisions are made in Hebrew. Um, interestingly, there was a legal challenge um, about public funding of translators uh, in Israeli courts. And 
um, human rights organizations won because Arabic was an official language. Um, now that it's not, is that going to change? I don't know. But in any event, what is clear is that when a Palestinian, a colonized person, steps into an Israeli court, whether through an interpreter or not, they must adopt and express themselves in the language of their colonizer. And ultimately, that's a challenge that faces all colonized people. Um, and that's something we have in common with our Irish brothers and sisters. Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you so much, Mira. Um, incredible, um, as, as usual. Um, so let's turn now to our next uh, panelist, who's Harry McCourt, uh, a solicitor at the newly established McCourt Solicitors in Lurgan in the north of Ireland. He practices in a broad range of legal areas spanning criminal defense, immigration and asylum, family and, and, uh, and public law. His talk will address the legal difficulties that have been placed in the way of the Irish language in the six counties. Away you go there, Harry. Nope, thank you. Um, my starting point here is that we're talking about the north of Ireland primarily today, but we have to sort of go back to uh, the colonization of Ireland from the beginning, the laws that have uh, affect Northern Ireland today and affect the Irish language in Ireland today are actually very old laws, one in particular, which is the 1737 uh, Administration of Justice Language Act, which is one that is a piece of legislation that has been overturned in the Republic of Ireland, but is still considered to be good law in, in Ireland today, in the North of Ireland today. In Ireland, uh, the uh, initial invasion obviously was in 1179 when the um, Normans came over. There was a period after that where uh, the Irish population and the invading population actually, uh, in the eyes of the English, got far too close together and uh, started to, the, the English and the Norman invaders started to speak Irish, started to interbreed with the Irish population, started to in, famously become more Irish than the Irish. And this led to the first legislation that was ever brought in to stop the Irish language and to really make the set the narrative that the uh, English language is to be the supreme language in Ireland and the language of the colonizer. Now, that start with the statutes of uh, Kilkenny. And they, they set down that the, the English population and the Norman population, anybody who wanted to own land and be part of the hierarchy must not speak Irish, must not interbreed with the Irish population. Now, they were vastly ineffective laws, actually, and for several years after that, they were largely abandoned because the English just didn't have enough control over Ireland to implement them. And the Irish language stayed very strong up until we sort of look at the map that I can't share it on my screen, but the map that Frank has uh, put uh, for the event, in which you can see that in 1800, the vast majority of the Irish map is still green, all, all but um, part of Ulster, which was planted, and which, what we would call the Peel around Dublin, where that also was planted and controlled by the English. The rest of Ireland primarily spoke uh, Irish, native Irish speakers from, uh, from birth. They were speaking and brought up in the Irish language. In the 1800s, there was a massive decline, and it wasn't primarily due to legislation, it was due to the aggressive famine that took place. The population of Ireland was decimated after that. There were millions of people died, millions of people left, and um, there was a lot of argument over what that happened, but uh, there's an awful lot to say that the population was deliberately starved to a point where large parts of the Irish-speaking population left. But to bring us on to the north of Ireland, north of Ireland became partitioned in 1921, and if you look at the map in 1921, the Irish speaking population in the north of Ireland is very small. There are some uh, Irish speaking areas in the north of Ireland. And basically, if you look at the map full stop, you will find that the parts that are green in 1900 are the most inhospitable parts of Ireland. You will see parts in the west of Ireland of Donegal and Galway and Mayo. And, in the north of Ireland, there's the Spurn Mountains on the Antrim Hills. Basically, these are anywhere where there's mountains that no one would normally want to live. That's the only places where, where Irish was still spoken because it wasn't worth colonizing. It wasn't worth the effort to, they didn't care if people spoke Irish because they didn't want that land in the first place. 
Now, from partition in Ireland until 1998, whenever there was a Good Friday Agreement, the Irish language had no recognition in the north of Ireland whatsoever. It was uh, treated as if it didn't exist um, as best they could. Um, the parliament that was in place until 1972 uh, did all they could at times at the beginning to stop any funding to the Irish language. And there was no legislation for the Irish language whatsoever. Um, the Irish language schools halved um, after the 1921 partition and anybody studying language, uh, the Irish language in any secondary school, the numbers also plummeted. In 1998, the troubles came famously to an end with the Good Friday Agreement. It was the first time there was any legislation in the north of Ireland to deal with the Irish language. Now, the Good Friday Agreement is a very important document in the history of the north of Ireland, in the history of Ireland, full stop. But it's important to note that it is a compromise agreement. It's, it's not a very radical piece of legislation um, beyond that it set the roots for people to sort of build from but it didn't ever set any firm laws to change things and it set uh, starting points and in relation to the Irish language I think there's maybe a paragraph that the uh, government should um, set in place a strategy to promote and protect the Irish language and that that's as far as it went and the idea was from there it would be built upon. And I think over the last 22 years, it, ha it hasn't. And that, that has largely been failed for a myriad of reasons. There has not been uh, an Irish Language Act put in place. And uh, the legal system has uh, needed an Irish Language Act because since 1998, there have been a number of challenges to try and further the Irish language in the north of Ireland, all of which have been either unsuccessful or minimally successful in that whatever um, success they had really didn't um, change the status quo. The most important applica um, application, as far as I'm concerned, is an application by, um, I may butcher the pronunciation of his name, Kieran Connectney, but it was Cahane's application in respect of uh, the cultural land. There was a, a man basically who was in uh, music, he was in a band, and he brought an application to the court in Northern Ireland um, to, for a liquor license for a, a, a night in the cultural land, which is a, it's a cultural, um, it's not the best way to describe it, it's a, a cultural building in West Belfast where they hold certain events. And he brought his application to the court and drafted it entirely in Irish. That application was refused. The court office sent it back and said, no, this has to be in English and is invalid otherwise. And Cahan was having none of that. And he um, instantly, he, he issued a judicial review um, to say that he was being discriminated against uh, and that his uh, application was in his native language and there's no reason why it shouldn't be accepted. That case um, eventually went all the way to the Court of Appeal and Cahan lost. Um, the Court of Appeal said that his application um, did not discriminate against him and that there was a piece of legislation that I referred to already called the 1737 Administration of Justice uh, Language Act um, that said that all legal proceedings on the island of Ireland must be in English and in no other language. Now, the court in the Court of Appeal said that that piece of legislation is good and that it's still valid. And they referred to the reasoning for that um, legislation being in existence that they didn't want um, lawyers drafting, um, they didn't want lawyers drafting legislation or applications to the court in Latin and French and trying to trick or ensnare people by drafting these applications that nobody understood. Now, that's clearly not the reason why that piece of legislation was created in 1737. 1737 was a real tipping point toward in Irish history. The, uh, Ireland had not yet been part of the Union. The Act of Union happened in 1800. Ireland was still, to some extent, uh, an independent colony of uh, Britain. It wasn't part of Britain yet. And the 1737 Act after that had catastrophic consequences for the pe people of Ireland. There are uh, a number of cases which have been recorded that took place after that where there were massive miscarriages of justice 
Um, again, if you refer to the map, you'll see that in 1800, mass, the, the vast majority of Ireland still primarily spoke Ang um, Irish. So imagine the vast majority of court cases in Ireland taking place in English and only English. And if you spoke Irish, you either had a interpreter appointed to you who weren't uh, professional interpreters, or if you were considered to speak a, a, a smithering of English, you weren't always appointed an interpreter and you were just considered, you, you'll have to deal with your case in English then and that's it. Now there's again a number of cases you can look up on you can see people who were sent to prison and sentenced to death in cases where they, they had no idea what was going on. And that obviously put a massive pressure on the population Ireland to start speaking English so that they could uh, defend themselves. But it also caused, uh, away from the criminal courts, an awful lot of pressure because after 1737, land became a massive issue in Ireland. Um, there were disputes about land, there was a dispute with landlords, and all of these court cases were taking place entirely in English. And there was more and more of a land grab. And you know, that's why you can see the white spreading from England where more and more English speaking people were controlling not only the land, um, but the people. Um, because uh, if you wanted to defend yourself, you don't want to defend your land, if you wanted to be in any way recognized, you had to speak English. Now, in the Republic of Ireland, the 1737 Act has been abolished, and more than that, I think it was last year, the year before, the President of Ireland granted a pardon um, to a man who was convicted in the 1800s for a murder that he didn't commit. Um, so the, the Republic of Ireland has gone as far as to show that this legislation was wrong, it shouldn't be in place, but there were people who were murdered, killed by the state, primarily simply just because they didn't speak English. So to me, it's, it's horrific that that piece of legislation is considered to be still good law in Northern Ireland. Cahane's application was maybe considered to be something over relatively minor. He wanted a liquor application for a night out, but I mean, the, the principle is important. Um, from then, you cannot um, deal with any proceedings in the North of Ireland in Irish. You can't bring an application in Irish, and it doesn't mean uh, very much to some, but whenever you're looking at the history of this is why this was put in place in the first place for the Court of Appeal to consider that to be good legislation after the Good Friday Agreement is, it does point towards the Good Friday Agreement isn't enough. The Good Friday Agreement set the, uh, set the uh, foundations for something to be built from then and that's why we need to have an Irish Language Act in place. Otherwise laws will continue to be interpreted in this uh, way that continues to um, defer to the language, the English language, the language of uh, the colonizer. Um, I'm a wee bit afraid I've talked too much and I don't know what the time is because I've kind of lost around myself. I have a lot more to talk about, but I've, uh, what's in my time situation like? I think you, uh, you're sort of knocking on the door 10 minutes now. Like, so if you're able to wrap up, that'd be grand. Well, that's it. I mean, my biggest last point that I was going to make is at the minute there's nothing but guidance um, that aims to uh, promote the Irish language and it's useless. Uh, last year, the Attorney General for Northern Ireland created guidance for the police service in Northern Ireland and the public prosecution service that they should follow in relation to the Irish language. Uh, it said that they should have their literature in the Irish language, they should have their code of conduct in the Irish language, and if you write to them in Irish, they should respond to them in Irish. I had a look last night. There is not one piece of Irish in the PSNI's website. There is not one piece of Irish in the public prosecution's website, and that uh, guidance was created a year ago. We need an Irish language act to make these things happen because otherwise it will be ignored. If you challenge it, you'll get a decision like the Hens where they just defer to this legislation that is vastly out of date. Thanks very much, Harry. Um, so we're uh, privileged then to move on to our third panellist, who is uh, Yoad uh, Ganadri Hakim. Uh, she's a clinical psychologist. She's joining us from, um, from Palestine uh, tonight. She's also the head of um, the Arab Psychological Union in Israel, and she's on the steering committee of the Palestinian Global Mental Health Network. Now, she works at the Palestinian Counseling Center in Jerusalem, and uh, she's gonna to talk to us tonight about language and mental health in the context of her clinical practice in Palestine. Over to you, Yad. Thank you, Frank. Good evening to you all from Jerusalem. I hope we, we will meet one day in, in Palestine as well. Today, I choose to share with you the conflicts I go through as a Palestinian professional working in a occupied Jerusalem. 
actually the conflicts between my native language, with, which is Arabic, and the official state language, with, which is uh, the Hebrew language. As a Palestinian, I was born and raised in Nazareth. Nazareth is the biggest city, biggest Palestinian city inside uh, Israel. I have been always speaking Arabic. My parents were speaking Arabic. My neighbors were speaking Arabic. And Arabic was just the, not only the, the mother tongue of mine, it was my culture as well. It was the way, the, the language that I used to think with, to dream with, and to communicate with. And then when I became older by time, I was uh, I experienced what colonization means, the colonization of my language, my culture, and my heritage. Actually, every day as a human being and as a professional, I'm forced to manage between this conflict, the conflict of my language and the conflict of the uh, uh, state language. When we are talking about colonization, actually, colonization is the, in for, the, the, uh, the for, forcing of control, forcing control of one state or a group of people uh, upon another group or nation. And in Palestine, we don't only experience the colonization of land and geography, but also the colonization of language. and. Tonight, I will be giving uh, uh, some uh, examples. To start with, it's very important to remember that Hebrew wasn't the uh, language used by Jewish people when they were before the establishment of Israel. Actually, Zionists didn't use Hebrew language. It was the language of the it was a, a religious language only, Hebrew. Only after Zionists established the state of Israel, they decided to announce Hebrew as the official language of the state of Israel. So it wasn't actually an alive language that a nation was using. People, ordinary people, ordinary Jewish people were using Yiddish and not Hebrew. But when they established Israel, they decided to erase not only the geography and the culture of the people, but also they decided to erase our language and instead to declare the uh, Hebrew language as the official language of the uh, state. Uh, even if 25% of the uh, people in Israel are Palestinian, 25% of uh, the citizens in Israel are Palestinians, but still we can't practice our language uh, freely. Imagine that one day you wake up uh, in the morning, you not only lose your city and your, uh, or your village or your house, you also lose your language. One day you wake up and you find out that, that your city is renamed. It's not anymore London or Liverpool or a, a whatever New York or Nazareth. Nazareth, for example, the, the, the city of Nazareth is, is named Nazareth 2000 years ago. It's written in the Bible. But when I go to my city, Nazareth, in the north of Israel, uh, the, the big sign in, uh, in the city says, Nasrat, which is, no one knows what is Nasrat. I don't even know what is Nasrat. No one knows what is Nasrat. And Nazareth is the biblical name of this city. It's the city of Jesus. And now the Jewish state decided that it is Nasrat. And that's it. So as a professional, I meet people who say they feel lost because they lose their language. And if I continue the example of Nazareth, not only it's named Nasrat, but also the bridge that you, the main bridge that takes you in 
to Nazareth, it's, uh, it's named Rahbam Zaevi. And Zaevi was one of the ministers, one of the Jewish ministers, who called for the transfer of Palestinians. So every day when I go to my city, I have to cross the, the bridge that is named after the main minister who called for the transfer of my family and my people. And this is how Israel is uh, colonizing my language. Not only the naming of the cities and the villages is erased, but instead of them, and instead of them, they put another non-familiar uh, uh, names. But also, for example, in courts, as Mira uh, said, uh, in courts, the only official language is the Hebrew language. In courts, if you are a victim or if you are uh, to be into, uh, to go through a, a court, you're uh, automatically in a lower position as a Palestinian because you need to use a language that is not yours. It's not the only the language of the foreigner, it's also the, the language of your enemy. You have to defend yourself by using the language of your enemy. And you can, if you can't master this language, you're automatically uh, in a lower uh, position. Another point to highlight is that the vast majority of therapists, of uh, counselors and psychologists in Israel are Jewish uh, practitioners. So if you are a Palestinian and you want to go to therapy through the official Israel Ministry of Health, I'm not talking about occupied West Bank or occupied Jerusalem. I'm talking about inside Israel. Uh, where we are around 2 million Palestinians living in inside Israel. If we want to get services from the ministries, we have to get them in Hebrew. We can't access any service in Arabic. And even if uh, my people want to go to therapy, they are uh, uh, expected to be treated by Jewish Hebrew speaking psychologists and Imagine that you go to therapy to be treated by your enemy, by the same person that you will meet a day after when he's a soldier on a checkpoint. He's the one that is supposed to, to treat you, to heal you, while you have to use their language and not uh, yours. Additional thing that in Israel, there are many words that we can't use. We are forbidden. Uh, these are words that are forbidden and illegal. And you can be sentenced if you go, uh, if you uh, insist to use them. For example, the word Nakba. Nakba is what happened to Palestinians in 1948. It is the, when it's the main, tragedy that my people went through. Nakba is a basic thing of my culture, of my people, basic tragedy of our history. And Israel want to uh, cancel it, to erase the uh, word Nakba. So if you use the, this word Nakba, in a school or as a teacher, or even as a, as a teacher of history, you will be, you will be taken to court. And you, you lose your, you won't have any opportunity to defend your case. So not only changing the names of the cities, not only naming bridges and streets on the, upon the names of, in my eyes, terrorists, uh, but also forbidding some of the main uh, words that we need to use in our day-to-day uh, -day life. As a therapist as well, I need to use some standardized tools in order to uh, measure what is happening to my people, like um, 
measurements of depression, many measurements of psychosis, or even many measurements of uh, IQ. IQ tests for adults are in Hebrew only. You can't find IQ tests for adults in Arabic in Palestine. So if you want to say this person is has a high IQ or he has mental retardation, you need to use only Hebrew tools. All the IQ tests that are in Arabic, available in Arabic, in the Arabic word, in the Arab words, and have been used for tens of years now, are not accepted in Israel. Even as a professional, I need to adapt Hebrew tools to measure my people, which, may, which aut autom automatically makes my people in a lower position. This and more we have to go through as professionals. And even when we present our cases, when we work, we have to get supervision, professional supervision from Jewish and Hebrew speaking uh, colleagues. I'm not talking about the professional level. I'm talking about the mere uh, absence of my language from the public arena and from the professional in the arena. And if I use some Arabic languages, uh, some Arabic language or some Arabic wordings, I'm looked at as a, in a lower position and I'm as if I'm less professional than my Hebrew, uh, my Jewish colleague. So this continuous conflict we go through as professionals in Palestine. That's why we established the uh, Arabic Union for uh, uh, Psychologists inside Israel to give, to give us opportunity to practice our language, to talk freely, to analyze our people in using our language and to express our ideas, not having to translate it all the time from Arabic to Hebrew, from Hebrew to Arabic. And then we establish the Global Palestinian Mental Health Network, which we use a, a only Arabic to ex express ourselves. And we believe that only by collective uh, collaboration, we can help our uh, language to stay alive and uh, keeping our language alive is a kind of resistance and language is uh, not only resistance, it's also a way of uh, uh, existence. And uh, I insist to use Arabic in all form and uh, I insist that the systems find a way to translate me and not that I find a way to translate myself to the other. I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Shukran. Um, that, yeah, that was incredible. Um, turning to our final speaker then, um, we're uh, very pleased to be joined by Kieran McGillivane, who is the Executive Director of the Culturlan, an Irish language centre in West Belfast. Uh, before that, he was advocacy manager for Conra na Gaelga, which is a social and cultural organization that promotes the Irish language in Ireland and worldwide. He's also lead spokesperson for Andram Jarg, which is the vibrant community-led campaign for an Irish language act in the north of Ireland. Over to you, Karen. Frank. I just wanted to thank you all for giving me the invite here. Um, there is a very proud and rich history of solidarity between the people of Ireland and the people of Palestine, and particularly this part of Ireland where I'm currently uh, coming in from in West Belfast. Um, that, that history is something that's very much with us today. The Cult of Land was mentioned there, and we host a, a solidarity event every year uh, with Palestine and the Cult of Land and stuff, and that's something that obviously I'm, I'm keen to, to, to build on and I'm proud to be part of, of this event. I just want to say about myself beforehand, Harry has covered much of the legalistic kind of context of the decimation and the deliberate destruction and cultural colonization of Ireland, which has meant that we are now trans transferred from speaking um, perhaps the oldest language 
in Europe, which is still in everyday use, to now speaking um, English as a majority tongue here in Ireland. There was a process by which that happened. It didn't happen by design. And, and it's why that we are careful to use the term minoritized language and that minority language. Minority language alludes that it was some part, part of a natural or organic process. Minoritized informs us that there was an actual process by which we were minoritized within our own country um, as language speakers. So in terms of myself, my family, I, I, was, I acquired Irish um, through uh, an, uh, schools that were established by pioneers in our area who took it upon themselves in spite of mass, massive hostility and obstacles that the state put in place against them, but to educate young people through the medium of Irish. Similar measures were taking place around the world, most notably thinking of the example of the Black Panthers uh, in the 1960s in America where they set up their own alternative uh, schools, free schools. Um, and this is what, what took place here as a means of reclaiming our language, a means of reclaiming identity, and also as a means of passive resistance. Um, Ireland obviously has been colonized for well over 800 years, um, and famously, or perhaps infamously, with, with in the eyes of the colonizers, it, it's known for its resistance, particularly the violent resistance to colonial rule. What, all, what isn't maybe as well known internationally is the huge uh, cultural and, and form and examples of passive resistance that have taken place in Ireland over many centuries that have, in many respects, saved, and, and I, I opened tonight's address in Irish, and were it not for those efforts of many hundred years previously, I, I just would not have been able, able to do that. Uh, my, my parents didn't speak Irish. Um, their great-grandparents did, and they were the last link in the long ling linguistic chain stretching back over millennia of uh, unbroken Irish speakers in, the, in, in, in Ireland. Um, and, and that was broken primarily in the 18th century, or sorry, in the 19th century, Frank alluded to, to the Great Hunger was one of the seminal events, obviously, which deliberately again, um, you know, targeted Irish speakers, the, the poorest of the poor within Ireland spoke only Irish. They were the ones who were decimated by the, by the Great Hunger, which was in, in many respects a genocide against the Irish people. Um, and beyond that then we had the uh, national school system which removed the teaching uh, of Irish um, uh, which prohibited sorry the teaching of Irish and which forced young people to to learn uh, English it's important to note that there were the British established national schools in Ireland before there were national schools in England and this wasn't part of any altruistic uh, you know uh, outreach to 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 support the development of, of the native people this was again a means of control um, Steve Beagle Somebody talked about uh, apartheid South Africa earlier. Steve Beagle, one of the founding fathers of, of Black Castles, has talked about the fact that the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the means of the oppressed. And the way in which you, you gain ownership of the means of the oppressed is by uh, teaching them your, their language and, and giving, them, giving them your language, the colonial language. So any attempt to undo that was always mess, met, met with obstacles and resistance by the state. Um, so uh, in terms of um, ourselves, obviously, Martin has covered much of the kind of legalistic context. It is important to point out that uh, we have been involved for the last four years. We've been involved for many years, but particularly uh, a particularly intense period for the last four years, campaigning for an Irish Language Act or for legal recognition or protection in law for the language. It's important to put that in context that um, all of the legislation that we have had thus far from the penal laws that such as county beforehand, right through to more modern uh, examples, have all been designed to decimate the language. We have never had any progressive legislation in respect to the language here. We have only had legislation which has been aimed to um, subdue or, 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 or persecute or marginalize and exclude the language. So what we are asking for is that the state finally removes the obstacles um, and they finally allows us to live our lives through Irish. And I was, I was obviously touched by what uh, you had was, was speaking about in the end. And it's important to remind ourselves all the time that what we are asking for here isn't a special privilege or isn't a special concession. It's the right to use and speak our own native languages in a free world. That is, that is essentially, it isn't a special privilege that anyone can give us, or it isn't a special concession that we have to beg for. It's a fundamental right that flows through all of us. And it's something that we should never make any apologies for asking for. Um, obviously, um, the Good Friday Agreement was touched on. I was 16 when the Good Friday Agreement um, was, was, was signed. I attended an Irish medium school. Our schools were denied funding. They were denied recognition from the British government. Our parents would have been in collecting money at the weekend to, to, to pray, provide support for the teachers. Um, they would have been in the weekends painting, painting the school halls and, 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 and uh, making sure that the place was tidy. We were taught in porta cabins that didn't have any heat or electricity or nothing of that kind. Um, but, but in spite of that, 
and in spite of the fact that we were located beside fully funded schools, increasing number of parents continued to send their kids to Irish schools. And the question was why? Because they also wanted to form a part of this passive resistance. They knew what it was. My brothers um, didn't have the, the, the good fortune of attending an Irish school because there was none in place. They were older than me. Uh, and when they went to school for history, they were taught about the, the English queens and kings. We, we were taught our own history, we were taught our own language, and it obviously informs um, who we are and, and, and leads to, to, to what you do in the rest of the So there's, there's a very obvious reason why the British um, didn't want to get involved in that and, and, and prevent, uh, prevented that uh, from, if you like, developing and, and going further and used all their, their both legalistic and monetary muscle to prevent the growth of various medium education, but they were just incapable of doing that. Um, and the man's called first year, I'm, I'm going to try and share a screen here. The school that I attended um, as a secondary school, um, uh, in a secondary school kind of high school, was then, uh, was denied funding. It was formed in 1981. It was denied funding right up until the Good Friday Agreement um, of uh, 1988. So for the six or seven years that I attended that school, there's a picture of us in that school, um, we were denied funding during that period. My, my large head is somewhere in the back row there. But um, we were denied funding. And at that point in time, this was in the early days of the peace process, so we imagine there was increasing international attention on this part of the world. People thought that there was an, a chance to bring the conflict finally to an end. And the British government were still steadfastly refusing to fund an high school. And it led people to ask the question, the very fundamental question of, you know, how sincere are the British about peace in Ireland? If they can't even fund an Irish medium school, and the the people who were involved, who were kind of long term activists, community activists, who were also involved in setting up the school, were able to able to leverage this pressure, and able to create what was called um, a litmus test, and that was the test for the British government. If you are sincere about what we say and, and building some form of peace in Ireland, then surely um, funding an Irish medium school would prevent no obstacles to you. It's important to stress as well, and I've touched on this, but the colonial experience that we had is mirrored by colonial peoples all around the world. So um, we've been reading people like Ngugi Wationko from, from Kenya, who recounts um, the humiliating, humiliating experiences that, that he underwent in school, talking about being caught speaking Gugu in the vicinity of school, and he was made to wear, um, he was made to wear a plate saying, I am stupid, I am a donkey, or he was made to, uh, he was he's beaten, uh, given corporal punishment. And this is very similar to the experience of the national schools in the 19th century in Ireland, where young children were forced to wear a bat to score, um, or a tally stick in English. And every time they, they were caught speaking in Aries, there was an added notch onto the tally stick, and then at the end of every day, they were beaten accordingly. And it doesn't take too long for this to inculcate in the people of Ireland a sense of deep shame, a sense of rejection of their own identity, um, and an embracing, if you like, um, uh, of, of the, the, the British identity. And I suppose this reminds me of the Paulo Ferrari quote, you know, about the overall aim of, of colonialism is around to make us walk like them, to make us talk like them, to make us look like them. That is the overall purpose. And that's what the, the idea of the national schools um, in the 19th century in Ireland, and obviously of their equivalent in Kenya during the 1940s and 1950s and the experience of, of people like Nguki Watayongo. But wherever you have that form of oppression, you will always have resistance to it. And that is as true in Ireland as it is anywhere else. In this part of, 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 of the north of Ireland, where there was a huge social, political, and cultural, um, if, if you like, force and state forces against the promotion of Ireland. And in the 20th century context, people talk about kind of the rise of fascist states um, across Europe. Um, it, is, it is my view that the first fascist state in Europe emerged in, in the north of Ireland in 1920. Um, with the um, Stormont regime, um, the Orange State, as it's been referred to, which almost overnight um, eradicated any progressive legislation around supporting the development of Irish and everything else. Having said that, um, in spite of all that, and in many ways underground, a network developed, which set up uh, their own centres, and which formed in 1969 a game changer. And it's really, really important to talk about this. That was the Shaw's Road Guild Act. That's where ordinary people came together, ordinary working class people, Poor people came together, pulled their money, bought a small plot of land, built their own houses, and decided to raise and live their lives through Irish. When they had children, they needed to send them to school, so they built their own schools. And this was the, this was the, the start of the Irish medium education experience. And that planted the seeds for the modern revival that I talked about. And because of that, 
And because of the many hundreds and the thousands of kids who immerse that, immerse in their own culture, immerse in their own identity, and with a strong sense of who they were, rooted in, in decolonization, this was an enormous challenge to the state. And in the modern context, when we have been arguing about, um, when we have been arguing about an Irish language act and the need for legislation, the colonial aspect is always deliberately hidden from that debate. There is a reluctance to talk about um, colonialism and decolonization, particularly in the part of the media here and liberal progressive um, kind of uh, institutions here that in one hand will say, yes, we are all for human rights, but please don't remind us of the, of the colonial past. But it's impossible not to because our cultural, political and social framework is informed by our colonial past. And unless we recognize that and talk about that and talk about the, the why we are all speaking in English, the majority of I walk outside my house today, the language I'll hear is English. How did we arrive at that point? You cannot have that conversation without going back into the past and informing that. And, and our view that, that, as I said, in terms of acknowledging that past, recognizing that it happened and moving on, that must be done with saying, okay, well, there was a wrong committed. How do we try in some way to make this right? And we do that by affording these people the rights now to live their lives through ours. And that's ultimately um, what, what we want to do. Um, we want to live our lives through ours. Um, I raise my kids through ours. I live my entire life through ours socially, but I still face a number of, of structural barriers that are rooted in the colonization of Ireland and that we still need to, to undo. We still face enormous political oppression um, and political opposition. The largest political party um, that we have in this part of the world is um, the DUP, who many of uh, maybe people tuning in from England are, are now suddenly aware of them. Uh, we've been aware of them um, for quite some time, but again, they have made uh, no problem and, and made no truck about sharing their distaste for the Irish language. Again, uh, just to share um, one of the, the, the highlights from the DUP's reel, and the, of which there are many, where Gregory Campbell talks about treating the Irish language act like toilet, toilet paper. Um, uh, and his colleague, um, Arlene Foster, who is the DUP leader, talked about places to stop squandering money on language schools. So we can see a continuum here. Um, but what I would say is, just to wrap up, and I'm conscious of the time, is that they all know that this is coming to an end. We all know that there is a, a new generation who have arisen and who will no longer are no longer content to, to sit at the back of the bus, um, that are willing to go out and campaign. And this has forced this issue, and this is outside of political parties. This is a, an autonomous youth-led social movement that have taken to the streets and that have held both the political institutions here, politicians and the media to account, uh, and have saying that, as I said, we're no longer willing to sit, sit in the back of the bus. We demand to live our lives through your eyes, and we demand recognition and rights from this state. So, Gurm Wagaf, I've heard you. Thank you. So thank you so much uh, for attending everyone and thanks for all the great speakers we had today. Kieran, Mira, Yad, and Harry, this was really incredible. So we're moving now to the questions and answers and we'll try to answer some of your questions. If you haven't already submitted your question, now is the time to do so. Um, so the first question is from Eamon McMahon, it's for Mira. And uh, is genocide another prohib prohibited term and Ilan Pape courageously uses it? Sorry, let me unmute myself, which is the new catchphrase of 2020. Um, yes, I mean, genocide in relation to Palestine is like pretty much any other uh, legal terminology, which is as soon as you use it in relation to Palestine. So, for example, nobody will uh, question you if you use genocide in relation to uh, what China is doing to its Uyghur population within the Western liberal progressive sphere. Um, and so, so we should use genocide in relation to what China is doing to its Uyghur population because it is attempting to erase their culture. Um, it is imprisoning and killing large swathes and it is essentially trying to wipe out Uyghurs. Now, in relation to Palestine, as soon as you use the word genocide, there is pushback. And that's the same in relation to almost every international legal concept. And it's interesting what you say about Ilan Pat Pape using it. Um, 
what we have as well is this phenomenon where Palestinians using words has been seen as illegitimate, um, it's seen as uh, immoral. And then when those words are used within Israeli discourse by an Israeli, um, all of a sudden that lends credence to the debate. So we see it the same way with apartheid. So in fact, even though the Israeli um, regime tries so hard to crack down on the use of the word apartheid internationally, there's actually a lot of discussion um, in Israeli newspapers about apartheid using the word apartheid. Um, but it's only legitimate when somebody else uses it when somebody else um, gives that seal of authenticity. And part of, I mean, Ilan Pape is obviously a fantastic historian, but part of his success has been that he is an Israeli voice. And when Palestinians use the same words, when Palestinians use the same terms, they are afforded less space, they are afforded less credibility. Thank you so much, Mia. So now the question is for you, Ad. Um, is there any link, so Jim Malone just was asking, is there any link between intergenerational trauma and native language proficiency? Does a native language act as a protective or risk factor? Can you, the second part of the question, I didn't hear. Does a native language act as a protective or risk factor? And Yoad, it may be helpful as well to note that you can see the Q&As if you click on the Q&A button as well. So it's written for you there from Jim Malone. Okay. I think I, I'm not sure if I got the question, the meaning of the question. I need to, uh, again, uh, translate from its a third language, you know, Hebrew, English and uh, Arabic. But anyhow, I think it's a protective language, a protective factor. Because if you insist to use your language, you can feel that you are part of a majority, you are part of a net, and being part of a collective uh, gives you an opportunity to feel stronger. But uh, while using Hebrew, you're still the minority. You are in the uh, you are a marginalized, unwanted, unwelcomed. Uh, uh, user of the Hebrew language. So, so I think uh, Arabic language is a protective factor, but it depends very much on the way, uh, on, on your lenses. Like uh, if, if you believe in yourself, if you believe in your nation, if you believe in your right, then the Arabic language is a protective factor. But even if you don't want to use your language, again, you're not welcome to use the language of your enemy. I, I know Hebrew by heart. I studied Hebrew. I, I, uh, I went to a Hebrew University of Jerusalem. I got my master degree in Hebrew. So I know Hebrew very much, but I'm not welcomed by the Jewish majority to use this language. So yes, uh, Arabic language is a protective language because it, it means I still exist as a nation. Did I get your, yes? Thank you so much. So uh, please, if anyone has any question, just type it in the question and answers button there. And the second question is also for you, Yoad. It's from Yasser. And uh, do you introduce yourself as Arab? Oh. Yo, you're muted. Of course, I'm an Arabic Palestinian woman. Of course, yes. What, what, what is the question? I am an Arabic Palestinian woman. Mm -hmm. so, but I, why do you wonder that? What, why are you questioning that? I'm a Palestinian Arab. All the Palestinians in Palestine are Arabs. Okay, so if you want to ask us to elaborate on the question, then we can get back to it. Half the Jewish people in Palestine are Arabs as well, because they have been in Arab countries. So you can be also Arabic and Jewish person in the same time. 
Okay. Yeah. So, and Jack Oliver was saying, hi, Yuad, thank you for sharing your experience this evening. There is evidence in literature our e-efficacy of BAM uh, counselors, uh, psychotherapy and BAM, uh, BAME uh, communities in the UK. Here, uh, some third sector organizations provide subsidized access. How is the movements in Israel developing to provide therapy from fellow Palestinians to Palestinians seeking help? Actually, by time, uh, thank you for this very important question, because by time we are encouraging more and more Palestinian to study counseling and uh, therapy. And we, are be we believe that practicing therapy in uh, our native language is the only way to bring your true self out. You can't be treated by your enemy, even as he by your uh, enemy's uh, language. So we're working very hard to bring Palestinian youth to study psychology and counseling. We are uh, uh, very much in towards providing uh, supervision and uh, encouraging uh, and professional help to our colleagues, even volunteering to do that so that by time in 20 years we can have a movement of Palestinian therapists and actually now the Palestinian Counseling Center is an NGO non-governmental organization. This organization has been active for 35 years now having uh, clinics all over the West Bank and Jerusalem and offering therapy in Arabic by Palestinians to Palestinians with a very um, it's a very accessible service and we have been uh, offering help for tens of thousands of people more than 35 years now. Thank you. Uh, so uh, from Laura Shihim, so thank you all for this incredible panel, throwing out the long known solidarity from Palestine to Ireland. Might you all speak to the various mechanisms that each of you use to resist cognitive and linguistic colonization despite the structural pressures. Um, Mira, would you like to go first? Um, so I think being familiar with your heritage um, and learning more about your heritage. I'm, I personally um, am essentially a second generation Palestinian in that um, my family were forced from their homeland um, before I was born. I still have family in Palestine. Um, but for us, hanging on to our language, our culture, um, our food, um, our uh, dancing, our uh, all of our cultural um, heritage um, is incredibly important in terms of um, keeping hold of our identity and knowing who we are because part of what colonization does is it removes your sense of self um, and I think you can see that with a lot of uh, immigrants who come from colonized countries um, and a lot of people living in colonized countries is that you start to lose your sense of who you are and where you are. And it's like uh, you had talked about that sense of loss. And I think the more that you participate in group shared activities, celebrating your own culture and your own heritage, um, that can help to uh, reestablish your feet on firm ground, as it were. Thank you, Mira. Uh, Yad, would you like to answer this question also? Yes, thank you, Lara, for being here tonight. Uh, I think by first sticking to our language, for example, not accepting to use the word uh, violence. My people are in a resistance situation. To be very picky towards the wording that they try to use towards us. For example, when they say the, the Gaza war, we insist to say the war on Gaza. It's not the Gaza war, it's the war on Gaza. So we use our terminology. We don't agree to sign 
for example, the a worldwide petition now going for the European Union asking us as organizations to uh, sign anti-terrorist uh, petition or something in, in, in turn of getting funds. I, this is the first time in history I, I, I hear about a, an occupied uh, nation that is asked to sign anti-terrorist uh, petitions against them themselves. So uh, the world is going, I think, uh, not, Ill, uh, not realistic, uh, a nonsense even. So first, we use our, we stick to our uh, terminology, our language. We believe that we can help our uh, people by ourselves. We are professional enough, we are good enough to offer our people the treatment and the therapy uh, they use. And we keep on existing and we keep on having life. You know what? We go to cinema, we sing, we, we, we marry, we love, we have kids, we go to school and we get very high academic degrees and we get very high uh, positions uh, in Palestine and in Israel while insisting of uh, defining ourselves as uh, Palestinian Arabs. So this is our way to defend ourselves. Thank you so much, Yad. Um, Karen, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you. I, I think this is an incredibly important question in terms of how we challenge the cultural hegemony under which we all exist. We live in a world that's dominated by Anglo-American culture, um, which is obviously derived very much in the colonization, which has impacted on us all. So in terms of challenging that, it's incredibly difficult, but it is, it is fatal. We have no other option. I think we do that in a number of ways. Um, there are a number of examples from our own history here in Ireland. Um, one, we have an amazing example through sport, an organization called the Gaelic Athletic Association or the GAA, uh, which is a voluntary community-led um, sporting institution, which is the biggest sport in Ireland, completely amateur, um, organized, run by volunteers, thousands of clubs, the length and breadth of Ireland, which are the lifeblood of um, social and sporting life across Ireland. And it was formed, it was formed very openly um, as a means of passively resisting colonization in Ireland and of undoing some of the harm of colonization. So Johad was speaking about the, the importance of having fun and stuff, and that needs to be obviously rooted in um, to everything we do for young children and particularly to become immersed in their own culture, it needs to be done in a way which is enjoyable and which is engaging and which is as good, if not better, than anything that the Anglo-American culture has to offer us. But I also think it's important, I think the cornerstone of it is education. Um, I think when we talk about, um, the, I mentioned earlier about the national school system and the fact that the British had a national school system here before they had one even in England. And it was reminded of, uh, we had a, a very famous revolutionary here in Ireland, a guy called Podgyuk McPeerys, um, who was one of the leaders of the 1916 um, uprising in Dublin. And he read a book um, describing the British education system in Ireland. And the book was entitled The Murder Machine. And what he said was that education should foster. This education is meant to tame. Education should inspire. This education is meant to repress. The English are two ways of people to educate the Irish in any worthy sense. So education is instrumental to anything we want to do. And I think the importance of empowerment that we get, get through education. And the more that our alienated culture is uncovered, then the more the oppressive reality in which it originates is exposed. So we, people can see that for themselves. And when we have provided this, when we organize community-led adult, adult education classes here in West Belfast, in an area which is suffering huge social deprivation, which is massive levels of unemployment, uh, and which has been marginalized and excluded um, by the state for, for centuries, if you like, when we offer classes to adults, people flock to them. So, because the knowledge of that alien culture leads to this transforming action and resulting in a, in a culture which is being like, freed, if you like, from, from that alienation. So, I think that, as I say, the fun element is really, really important, sport and things like that, but education for me is also essential. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. So, Harry, would you like to answer, please? I try to unmute myself and turn my video off. 
Um, I don't think there's much more I can say than Kira hasn't said there. In, in, in relation to the Irish language, I mean, one of the best ways uh, that the Irish language has defended itself is, as Kira said, is local community um, getting together on promoting Irish language. I mean, in, in the Lurgan area, the Irish language is only promoted by local community groups. And um, that's those people just need to come together more and more to put pressure for an Irish language act to be put in place. And it's all about showing that it's not threatened. I mean, more and more, uh, anytime uh, people try to pump uh, the Irish language, there's the likes of the DUP, they try to say, they're, they're very threatened by it, and they say that it's, it's, it's politically motivated, that the Irish language is trying to rip uh, the north of Ireland out of the uh, United Kingdom. And them saying that is politicising the Irish language. I mean, when you read about the Irish language and you hear an awful lot of people saying, oh yes, but the Irish language was highly politicised during the Troubles because the, uh, it was used by members of the IRA and the NLA. And, but was it not being suppressed before that? Was that not politicising the Irish language? I mean, sort of recognising what has happened in the first place and making people see what is recognised, uh, recognise what has happened in the first place rather than blaming the, the reaction to that as a way of putting Irish language down. Um, but I think there's an awful lot recently has sort of caught a lot of these people off guard. I mean, as Kieran said, education, whenever you know there's kids enjoying the Irish language, there's kids sort of who can speak the Irish language and there's cartoons being made in the Irish language. I mean, this is just something that's no longer associated with the sort of sinister elements that they try to portray it as. Unfortunately, that's obviously not coming across because uh, something I was going to talk about earlier and I ran out of time was, I mean, we have that case in England where there was the uh, headstone that wanted to have in our hearts, it was in our hearts always or in our hearts forever on the gravestone in Irish. And a judge in England basically said, no, you're not having that because that, you know, somebody could look at that and think that's, that's, that's a politically motivated slogan, which was just bizarre just because it's in Irish. It was associated with uh, you know, they, he tried to connotate that that was associated with terrorism and there's absolutely nothing to do with that whatsoever. So to kind of continue to promote the Irish language community, continue to promote it through sport, through entertainment, uh, more and more there are more Irish language TV shows with more films that are actually hitting the mainstream that have you know bits of Irish in them and it, it sort of disarms these people who are trying to make it out to be this uh, sinister code that it's, it's not. Okay, thank you so much, Harry, and thank everyone. <laughs> thank everyone who has just answered. This was like incredible answers. So, um, so I'm just gonna say the Katie Leacock uh, just said thank you so much for this discussion. Some brilliant speakers. So, her question is What is the status of Palestinian Arabic and Irish language literatures in Palestine and Ireland? Are there attendant uh, movements to produce art in these languages, and how do they face similar difficulties? in their distribution. Um, Mira, would you like to go first? Um, in terms of Arabic, in fact, my answer isn't only in relation to Palestinian Arabic. What you have across the Arab world is educational institutions, um, institutions of art, literature, learning, who uh, increasingly over the years have adopted English or have adopted other languages for teaching. So for example, if you are in not only um, Palestine, but um, if you're in Jordan, if you're in Lebanon, um, you go to university and you study, and much of your study will be in English. Um, and obviously that's a little different than what we were talking about in terms of studying and, and learning in Hebrew. But at the same time, what that means is that you are not learning the tools of your own language. So uh, what we've seen across the Arab world is the effect of colonization in the denigration of Arab literature. And there is a very, very proud tradition and history of Arab literature, Arab poetry, um, that's still being kept alive, but which is under attack not only in Palestine but across the Arab world and part of the the problem is that in a way we have colonized ourselves it's seen as um, 
much more uh, prestigious to um, attend a Western-based university. You have, um, for example, universities like Georgetown um, who set up satellite campuses across the Middle East. Um, and if you go to Georgetown in the Middle East, you're not learning about Arabic literature. You're not learning the tools of your own language. You're learning about English. Um, and so that's been a denigration that's applied across, across the whole of the Arab world. Shukran, Mira. Um, yeah, do you have anything to add? Uh, actually, two parts. Part one is uh, Arabic. We don't want Arabic to be the language of the folklore, the language of the his history. We want Arabic to be the day-to-day -day official language that we speak with that we treat with. And in uh, Palestine, there is all the time attacked against the Arabic language. Whenever you want to express yourself, you have uh, to translate uh, yourself uh, into Hebrew. There are many movements inside Israel for Palestinians to create a theater, drama, uh, arts uh, in Arabic, but there are lots of limitations on the freedom of uh, express, uh, expression, and there are limitations of uh, funding uh, these events. So artists face huge challenges in uh, attracting funds, and usually they fund themselves. So they have, they are all the time under attack. In terms of the um, schooling system, uh, in for example. Take, uh, for example, in occupied uh, Jerusalem, uh, there is all the time, a, a, a Israel all the time is trying to impose their high school academic system upon Palestinians. So schools that use the Palestinian high school system is no, uh, no longer funded and the high school certificate is no longer accepted by local universities. And even the uh, Jerusalem uh, University Abudis that uh, uh, teaches uh, medicine and the students there are upon the best universities in the world in terms of uh, uh, medicine. Uh, the student, their degrees aren't accepted in uh, Israel and each year they have to go into court uh, to gain uh, a certificate that, to gain a license uh, so to enable uh, these doctors to work in Israel and actually the highest percentage of success in the medical uh, exam uh, of in Israel uh, are students studying uh, in Abu Dhabi University. The percentage is more than 98 percent of Palestinian stu students going to Abu Dhabi University uh, past the Israeli Ministry of Health uh, uh, exam. So our language and our art, our culture is under attack. We are still trying to defend it. Okay. Um, so yeah. What? Uh, yeah. So, uh, Karen, would you like to talk about what is the status of the Irish language uh, in Ireland and uh, add uh, on the speaker's answers, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as, as possible. Um, I think uh, the, the status of Irish language literature is, in one hand, it's emerging as a result of a, of a growing community, a growing young community, but it also faces huge structural problems um, and barriers. The biggest problem we face is the fact that our second language or our first language is English, uh, the most dominant language in the world with access to huge amounts of culture. And it's an incredibly difficult challenge to try and penetrate that in terms of literature, um, films and other things with a, a standalone product, um, which can go, if you like, toe to toe or can stand in competition with what Hollywood is producing or what the greatest English novelists are producing around the world. It's incredibly difficult and it's in a very uneven struggle, if you like, in terms of producing literature that could, that could be in competition with that. Having said that, um, there are a number of strides um, taking place, particularly um, targeting young people and encouraging young people to embrace um, 
to embrace the language and and, and that kind of literal sense um, as well. I think, uh, you know, touching on what you had said as well, that is something that we have faced. The idea that that Irish has been taught as a historic language or as a as a relic to the past or as something that can give us a and that is something that is living and relevant right now in this in this day and age. Um, and for instance, in our university courses, I had done an Irish language degree here in Belfast. And I would say that the large part, the content may have slightly changed, but the structure of the course that I'd done would have been the exact same 100 years ago. There was no real change. So it was literature and grammar and stuff. But in terms of Irish as a living language and preparing me for skills as an Irish language speaker, and today, there was very little um, that was relevant to me or that I could use um, beyond beyond that beyond uh, university. I would also like to touch that there are a number of notable exceptions within Ireland of a crossover between Irish language literature and, and Palestine. Also, we have um, a very famous poet here, Gabriel Rosenstock, who wrote a poem a number of years ago, um, Oh My Palestina, Oh My Two Palestinians, about comparing the loss of, of he, he heard a story of two Palestinian girls who had been murdered uh, by the ADF and he wrote a, story, a poem about his own daughters and I'm imagining having to go through this. And we also have Roisin El Safdi as well, whose father is Palestinian and lives out in Galway and was raised through Irish and Arabic who have, has produced a number of amazing songs and stuff about the Palestinian struggle in the Irish language. Um, so there are, there are um, kind of stuff there. I just wanted to throw that in there for what it was worth. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Karen. And I think thank you means good. Oh my God, and Irish. So, yeah. Perfect pronunciation. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, Harry, can you build on this, or I have anything to add? I'm talking when I need it. I'm just saying that there's not very much that I could add to what Karen said. I'm just interested in this next question here about uh, the public schools. Yeah, go on ahead then, do you want to read out the question and then answer it if you want? There's a question here, like my question is about Ireland. What is the government doing to promote Irish and public schools now? Are community members involved in Irish language revitalization, especially younger generations? What about history classes in public schools? Are children being taught about the history of their heritage and ancestors? Are younger generations aware of their grandparents and great grandparents went through and what Irish means to them? And I think I'm interested in that question. I think Frank will sort of agree with me. Me and Frank went to the same school in uh, the north of Ireland here and uh, the Irish language was uh, not to be talked about. Um, it was an integrated school that was meant to sort of uh, reflect both communities and give uh, both communities uh, sort of equal standing, but I think it's fair to say and I think Frank would agree with that it did not in any way um, do that at all. Um, when you were in uh, your lower second and upper second school, you could learn Japanese if you want, and there's nothing wrong with learning Japanese, but it's a pretty bizarre language that they chose that and decided that they would throw that into the curriculum, curriculum because nowhere in Northern Ireland uh, do they teach Japanese anywhere else, but the Irish language just was never touched upon. Um, I know that that is still the case today because my younger sister is an awful lot younger, I mean, she still goes to that school, and that is a fairly well-respected high-ranking school in the north of Ireland here. Um, as far as public schools are concerned, there are an awful lot more um, Irish medium uh, primary schools. Um, as far as I'm aware, and Kieran may correct me, but I don't think there's any Irish medium secondary schools in the whole of the north of Ireland. Um, um, and there's, it's, it, as far as public schools are concerned, it's, it's obviously discouraged since the type of thing that an Irish language act is required because the Irish language um, primary schools that exist, by and large, almost all come from community pressure. Um, like Kieran's own experience, they come from small communities coming together and bring it, put these Irish uh, medium primary schools together themselves. Um, there's no government support for these. There's no uh, government funding for these. And as I was saying earlier on, the, the government in Northern Ireland has little to no recognition of the Irish language at all, other than, yeah, we should uh, encourage and promote that at some point, but it's never, ever been done, which is why there is this big pressure and this movement now to have an Irish language act to address that and deal with that once and for all. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so good how I got again. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Harry. Um, so now the question is for Yad. Um, does the official education system in the West Bank 
represent Palestinian history and culture in such a way as to sustain Palestinian resistance? I hope so. I hope so, but not uh, not not enough. This is my uh, uh, this is my answer. Actually, in in Palestine, we live in two parts. We live in a occupied West Bank, and we live inside Israel as Palestinians. Palestinians in occupied West Bank and uh, part of Jerusalem still uh, can uh, study a, a Palestinian system, educational system. Uh, where we uh, the system try to maintain uh, uh, resistance uh, and maintain the dignity of us as Palestinians. Palestinians living inside Israel, we have to go through the Jewish uh, system of uh, the academy. For example, me myself, I had to take credits in Torah in the uh, Jewish. A religion in order to uh, finish my high school. I couldn't take uh, credits in, uh, for example, Islam or uh, Christianity, but I had to do credits in Judaism. So, uh, and the system inside Israel doesn't give me any opportunity to learn about my heritage and about my history. History is of uh, Palestine begins only in 1947, when the state of Israel uh, started to uh, uh, to be uh, established, so it's very distorted uh, system inside Israel, and uh, in the West Bank, we're still trying to help our uh, student to be exposed to our heritage and culture. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Rad. And uh, from the same person, Martin Kemp, he's also asking you, how is Palestinian history taught to Palestinian children within the 48 or Israel? Uh, I actually read the Martin uh, question, so I, I tried to combine the, uh, the answer for two questions. Actually, Martin, we, we don't teach, uh, we don't uh, study any of our uh, uh, history. The Israeli system doesn't want Palestinians to be exposed to the Palestinian narrative. Only one narrative is available in Israel. It's the Israeli narrative. It's the Israeli uh, uh, narrative of a, a, a liberation of this land by the settlers. But we have a different a narrative, the narrative of colonizing this uh, uh, this land, the narrative of of using uh, of losing our land geography, trying to erase our uh, memory, trying to affect our subconscious. But this narrative is not taught in school. Actually, we can be uh, held uh, and accused in courts of if we teach our children this uh, narrative. That's why families try to help their children learn about history in, in not in a direct academic way but in a, some indirect and NGOs working uh, in this field. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much, Yad. Um, so let's see the questions. Uh, so from Eamon McMahon and he's uh, asking to the Irish comrades on the panel, we are still struggling for our rights here in the north and much remains unresolved and contested, including the national question and the language question. But it is a very different kind of struggle and so much has been achieved in terms of access to education, to the professions, to housing and etc. Are we perhaps a model still emerging for a one-state solution in Palestine? Um, Karen, can you answer? Can you go first? Uh, yeah, well, I'll try. I'm, I suppose I'm, I'm very reluctant to draw any direct parallels um, because there are always enormous differences um, between, um, you know, the suffering of, of, of different peoples. And when I, when I you know, look at, at um, what's taking place today in Palestine, and the attempts um, and successful attempts, as we see increasingly, um, of, of Israel and of her agents at limiting the scope for debate and the parameters for debate 
around the existence of Palestinian lives and, and their rights. Um, uh, you know, it, it, I, I would be reluctant to, to draw a parallel between that uh, and the Irish experience. Um, what I would say is what is incumbent on us um, in Ireland, um, and we still have a number of outstanding issues, as um, the, the person who asked the question alluded to, but what we can do is show um, unwavering and unstinting solidarity to the Palestinian people. Um, I think that without drawing direct parallels between our struggle and, and offering potential roadmaps, I don't think that has worked well for us in the past. I think that we still have a number, a number of big structural challenges here to overcome. We still have enormous levels of poverty uh, in, in areas that have suffered hugely during the conflict. We still have a very unequal society. We still have, in many respects, um, a lot of these structures that have derived directly from colonialism in Ireland, both North and South. So we still have a number of things to get right ourselves before we start to tell others what they should and shouldn't do. Um, but I think as anyone who's interested in human rights and who has um, any respect for self-determination and equality, um, what we should do is just show unstinting solidarity to the Palestinian people. Thank you so much, Karen. Harry, uh, would you like to build on this? Again, there's not much more to add on to that. It's very hard and very unfair to draw parallels with what's happening here and what's happening in, in Palestine. I mean, from the legal context over the last 20 years since the Good Friday Agreement, there have been a number of legal challenges brought by way of judicial review against decisions <coughs> made that have discriminated against the Irish language. There, there's one which is again about something quite minor. There was a prisoner in McGabbery who was uh, carving. Uh, carvings in his cell and uh, he was banned from having Irish words on these carvings and he successfully challenged the prison's uh, rules around that. And you can't imagine that happening in Palestine the same way. I mean, you know, in Palestine, if you're a prisoner, you're not going to be calling your lawyer up and getting your legal aid to do these things. I mean, in Palestine, your life is very much at stake. I mean, you, it's very hard uh, to say that you know there, there, we can say, oh, why don't you issue a judicial review? Why don't you uh, do this? Whenever we're not under a, not under a, a brutal military regime anymore. I mean that that uh, era has passed to some extent. So we are we're lucky in that regard. Okay, thank you, Harry. And uh, I'm gonna take the last question uh, before we wrap up. So apart from the uncultural loan, um, are there other Irish language centers in the six countries? Um, yes. Um, More disturbing images this time from oh, Gaza. Oh, Sorry, I was trying to locate a video for the chat function there. Um, yeah, there are. I mean, the Kuldanan, um was the first. It's important to say that next year we celebrate our 30th anniversary. Um, but as a result of that, it's acted as an exemplar for others. And we now have um, a cultural center in Derry. We have one in Armagh. Um, and we have also a number of, of uh, smaller kind of buildings that would accommodate um, Irish language classes, Irish medium youth clubs, and stuff like that. Um, but the Cult uh, I would say this because I am biased, is still very much the uh, jewel in the crown, if you like, um, and it's still very much the epicenter of, of Irish language life. And I think, uh, referring to another earlier question around challenging the kind of cultural hegemony, I think what's important is that we have spaces, that we have social spaces in which people can meet, people can come together. When people come together, good things generally tend to happen. And when you create an atmosphere where, as one um, Irish academic here referred to it, where the dominant acoustic is that of Irish, then you will create a, a particular culture um, whereby new ideas emerge in Irish, where new relationships develop in Irish. And that's what the Cult of Man is about, and that's what the other centres are about also. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up in Arabic and then Frank will wrap up in English. Um, so shukran la kel hada hadrna, shukran la our speakers, the Yuad, Mira, Karen, and Harry. Thank you so much, and shukran la wujud kun maana. The hakimat kun kani ktiir halu, and shukran la al hadur fi maana akther min sabiin hada mi hadrna. 
نحن كثير بنقدر هالشيء وان شاء الله بنتمنى انه نشوفكم بايفنتس ثانيين ونحن كلندن ليرنينج كوبريتيف عندنا كذا كلاسز اند سيرفيسز بليز تشوفوا موقعنا على الانترنت اند اذا انتم لايك انترستد باي شيء او بدكم تتعلم ايريش او عربيك او اوردو حتى اند اذر ماني اذر حتى سيرفيسز كثير غير سجلوا واشتركوا معنا اند ثانك يو او شكرا كثير لحضوركم فرانك ود يو لايك تو ريفر شير ثانك يو سو ماتش ام ايفري ون فور اتندينغ Um, I just want to draw everyone's attention to this Palestinian concept of Samud. I mean, it's something I've been speaking about with a lot of comrades, but with uh, Imtithal in particular, obviously she and I and, uh, and Ben are trying to forge this uh, London Learning Cooperative together and to create this international network of people who are committed to language and other um, r radical pedagogy as a mechanism of uh, pushing back against uh, capitalism and imperialism. And Samud is a... Fascinating concept that I had first discovered when I went to visit Palestine for the second time. The first time I went, actually, uh, incidentally, was with Harry. Uh, we, uh, we go way back, he and I, and we sort of go everywhere together. Um, Samud means steadfastness or steadfast perseverance, and it's an ideological sort of theme and political strategy that first emerged among Palestinian people um, through their experience of both oppression and resistance in the wake of the 1967 um, war that Israel waged. Um, and I think it's a, like it's a it's it's an incredibly moving concept that I find um, incredibly pertinent to the Irish experience as well. I think the fact that the Irish language was so violently attacked in ways that the panelists um, this evening have explained, and yet it has survived, that seems to me like a very profound connection between the people of Ireland and the people of Palestine. Um, and it's to be hoped that just as our language and our culture survived, and uh, and we have in, in a sense our own Irish concept of some other. Um, I, uh, I just think that's a really beautiful um, correspondence between our two peoples that we should be trying to explore and cultivate. Um, I think it's fair to say that what emerges from what we've heard tonight is that the language um, and history of both Ireland and Palestine is considered deeply threatening by both British and Israeli um, imperialism. And uh, I think Israeli apartheid in particular is, um, is incredibly weak Um, it's, uh, uh, it's incredibly vulnerable to assertions of the mere fact of Palestinian existence. Um, in many ways, Zionism is the racist colonial lie that the land had no people. And so it makes sense that Samud should emerge as a concept uh, pursuant to which the mere existence of a Palestinian is resistance to Zionism. Um, the mere fact of the continued existence of a, of, a, of a single Palestinian person puts the lie to the Zionist racist myth that the land had no people it it does have a people and they are called palestinians um so what we want at london learning cooperative is uh we want palestinians running around Palestine speaking in irish and we want the zionists to be just as baffled and threatened by that simple fact of palestinian children speaking uh, the irish language as the british colonizers are just as we want irish kids running around in west belfast and doira and the other places in uh, the island of ireland Um, speaking Palestinian Arabic. We want um, our languages that are so threatened by the colonizers, the respective colonizers that have threatened us um, in various ways. Uh, we want our language to, to serve as a, a way of overcoming that uh, violent uh, oppression. Um, we, want it to, um, uh, we want our languages and our cultures to look outwards so that, um, that we can connect with each other on a more profound and a more human level. Um, we want uh, Palestinian comrades playing the Gaelic games in Ramallah and Nazareth. Um, and for the Zionists to be just as confused to see our Irish cultural forms of resistance being taken up by another colonized people. Um, we, want to, we want to learn to speak each other's languages and to inhabit each other's ways of seeing and being. Um, and as an Irish man, I'm stunned by uh, the Samud, by the steadfastness of the Palestinian people. I, I, every day I think, uh, I think about it and it's just absolutely stunning. Um, the, uh, the humanity of the Palestinian people in the face of uh, Zionist apartheid, the, bar the sheer barbarity of um, what the, um, the Israeli state is trying to do to people of Palestine is horrific. And yet um, the Samud that Palestinians are able to uh, manifest in response to that is an inspiration to anyone who aspires to, um, to greater humanity. Uh, so thank, thanks to everyone for um, participating in this gathering with us tonight. Uh, first of many, we can but hope. Um, do check out our website and see what we're trying to do 
uh, contribute, get involved with the, the international forms of solidarity that we're trying to forge together. Um, and all, all that remains to be said in Irish and in Palestinian Arabic is Garami Agat Agus Shukran. So Shukran and Garami Agat everyone, uh, thank you so much for attending and thanks for our incredible speakers. To see you in uh, much more events. Have a good evening. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye, Mira Imtisal. Bye. Bye. Bye, Frank. <laughs>